All right. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so this morning, I want to uh, minister to you out of a passage uh, in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to that scripture there. And uh, we're going to go ahead and read this story. Amen. Y'all ready? Let's read together. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to meet, which is old King James for meaning he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him or invited him, saw it, He spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. He just forgave them. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said unto her, Your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for your glorious word, Lord, and the beautiful plan that you have set in place for mankind to be able to know you and to serve you, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful story, Lord God, that tells of an extravagant love, Lord God, of a sinner that was saved by grace, Lord. I pray that you would help us to learn from this woman's life, Lord God, and what you did in her, what you desire for us to learn. Lord, that we would be able to take her actions, Lord God, and understand, Lord, that there's great value in what we see here, Lord, and that We pray that you would uncover it for our hearts and lives, Lord, that we also would be overwhelmed in your presence, Lord God, that we would experience in our own hearts that powerful forgiveness, the anointing, Lord God, that she was able to experience. Lord, we pray that in our own hearts and lives, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, there's a lot to this story, and I got to be honest with you, whenever I was reading it and the more I began to study it, As it always is with the Bible, there's so many different, at least for me, that I start to imagine so many different scenarios that could be taking place within the story. And i got to be honest with you, I'm probably going to end up saying some things that you can't prove from the story. But there's some of this kind of, something like this is going on. There's There's some things happening behind the scenes that are between the lines just based on the information that we are given. There's a whole lot more going on is the point that I'm trying to make. And while we can't prove it all, uh, I'm going to still mention some of the things that I felt like the Lord put on my heart in the midst of all of this. And, you know, one of the main aspects of, the, of this particular story that I began to see was that there's at least a comparison and a contrast between the pride of this Pharisee and the humility of this woman. 
you can see that that there's that there's pride and then and then she represents humility but but also maybe a rela- a, a, a teaching on the difference between external religion and internal relationship you know so many times people and and many of us hopefully are starting to come out of that but there's so much bondage connected to a spirit of religion you have to be careful that you yourself don't become with time, whether you come to this church, if you move out of town, go somewhere else, whatever, as life goes on, that you don't become complacent as you begin to understand the ways of God and the word of God more clearly as a disciple and you begin to learn that you forget that, that people are under the bondage of, this, of a spirit of religion. I need you to understand that there's a, ma- there's a definite control spirit connected to a spirit of religion. Because it doesn't want people to truly be able to be free. It doesn't want people's minds and hearts to be free to worship the Lord to where they can experience God's presence and his delivering power. And so, in tr- and listen, we, we, many of us come out of Catholicism, and it's easy to talk about Catholicism, but it's much bigger than that. It's in Protestant churches everywhere that you go and you and once you're once you've been delivered from a spirit of religion or set free where the Lord moved you out from it listen if anybody that that's been in a church and you can look backwards and you can say that church had a spirit of religion there was a control spirit in that in that church it doesn't mean that there, that the preacher didn't love God it doesn't mean the people didn't love God It doesn't mean that you never experienced the word of God or the moving and operation of the Lord. None of that, that none of that is true. You can, the Lord can still show up in services like that, in churches like that, and minister to people. That is true. But the underlying thing is this, that the actual absolute truth of God's word for the way that it's written is not being revealed. The Holy Spirit is being hindered in some way, shape, or form, and people are being controlled. And listen, most of the time, the preacher does not know what he's doing. He himself is under a spirit of control. And I got to tell you something. The demonic spirits do not want to release people from that atmosphere. You do what you want with that. I'm not here to pick on anybody else's church or anybody else's preacher. I'm stating the facts that the same spirit that was alive in the Old Testament and was alive in the New Testament is still alive in the modern church, and it infiltrates many a church, and the people are the sad collateral damage because they're stuck in a place, and they're never able to truly be set free. They feel like they are free. They feel like they are serving the Lord, but they don't understand that they're really like Egyptian slaves and that God is saying, like he spoke to Moses, Let my people go so that they might worship me. Demon spirits aren't going to want to let people go. So there's a a story within this too. I'm not even really going to get into that part of it that much. But this guy, this Pharisee, is filled with a spirit of religion. Okay, And so we see the pride versus the humility, the external religion versus the internal relationship. And in order for internal relationship to take place, there has to be forgiveness. God cannot move towards an unrepentant heart. Well, he can move towards it. He can draw it. Jesus said that, you know, unless the Father draws you, you won't come to me. God the Father draws by his Spirit, and he'll allow the Word of God to minister to our hearts. So he does draw us, but the point that I'm trying to make is is that in order for us to really be able to connect to the Lord, there has to be forgiveness. And in order for forgiveness to take place, first of all, a person needs to understand that forgiveness is needed right? Sometimes people don't even understand that forgiveness is needed, that they think that they're doing fine. And many times that can happen in the midst of a spirit of religion. Like, you know, or, you, and listen, even in a church like this, don't think that you're safe. Don't think that you're safe. It doesn't matter how much somebody preaches the truth. You yourself can be bound by a spirit of religion, hypocrisy, self-righteousness, thinking more highly of yourself than what you ought, and thinking that you yourself are okay when in reality you're not. I'm not the judge of your heart, my friend. The Lord is. Amen. And I'm just trying to warn the people. I'm trying to warn myself. Hey, listen, don't don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought. Because, see, that's, that's, again, pride versus humility, and I can't say it enough. I say it almost every time I preach. God resists the proud. 
but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. I don't even think we understand what that means. I don't think we even understand what that means spiritually, financially, business, leading and guiding, re revelation in the scripture, humility. God is drawn towards humility. Satan is the example we have in the Bible of pride. It was pride that caused God to reject him and to cast him down. Humility is the characterization of our Lord. He condescended. He became a man because the children were partakers of flesh and blood. He became the same. So that why? So that he could die for us to set us free from the bondage of, the, of, the, of, the, of death that was held by the enemy. Jesus condescended, Jesus lowered. How many times have we talked about that? He rode into town on a donkey, not a stallion. He was born in a manger. That, those are just some of the sins. He said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. He laid down, he knelt down and washed their feet. Oh no, you're not gonna wash my feet, Lord. Oh no, if I'm not gonna wash your feet, then you have none of me. See, the Lord wants you and I to understand that whenever we start to think, sometimes we can't even see what we think about ourselves. Lord, help us not to be like this Pharisee. Lord, give us a heart like this woman. You know, in order for, for, for this relationship to take place, it must be an understanding that forgiveness is needed and also a proper understanding of who has power to forgive. Amen? There's a, a one scripture. It's in Romans 3, uh, 23. I'm going to just go ahead and go to it real quick. I don't have a lot of side scripture, so we'll just use this one. Romans 3 and 23 and 24. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we still come short of the glory of God. Some of us, hopefully, we don't still come short of the glory of God in certain areas where we used to come short of the glory of God. But if we're not careful, we won't even be able to properly discern the intents and motives of our own heart, and we'll just bypass that. You see, it's and, we're, and this is towards the end of my message, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. But sometimes God wants to cause us to check what's going on in our heart, the thoughts that we're thinking. See, you can learn a lot about yourself and the condition of your spirituality if you just stop for a moment and think about how you've been thinking about other people or what you're thinking about or what has you know, not say control of your mind, maybe control of your mind, but what has your attention? Let's put it like that. And, 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 and the way that you think about other people when you, when you encounter them and the things that are going on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and that's for each of us, I think, that we learn in this story to be aware of that, right? So it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us has and we still will in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes it's small things, sometimes it's big things. But look, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I'm trying to talk about relationship to you this morning, and I'm trying to let you know that in order for true relationship to be able to take place between the believer and their Lord, then forgiveness has to happen. Forgiveness has to happen, and in order for forgiveness to happen, somebody's got to realize they need forgiveness, number one. Amen. And number two, they need to understand how forgiveness comes. It comes, and I know y'all know this, but let's just be always be reminded we should love the word of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Oh, man, what are you talking about redeemed? Look, he paid for you. You need to understand that. He paid for you. He paid for your salvation. He paid for your freedom. He paid for your deliverance. He paid so that you could live for him and so that you could have access to grace to serve him. Hallelujah. He paid so that you could be right in the eyes of the Father through his precious blood. The Bible says that you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Amen. So I wanted you to see that this morning. I wanted you to see that. And that's a big part of, I think, of what's happening in this story. And point number one is this. She had a purpose. I just put this little piece of passage right here. When she knew that Jesus sat in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, when you read this story and you compare it to the other Gospels where there's similar type stories, to be honest with you, you start to wonder. It doesn't seem like it's the same exact occurrence. It seems like Jesus was anointed two different times. One time, and I, I mean, you can't prove it because not all the information is here, but when you really start digging, 
It seems like one time he was actually anointed later towards the time when he's going to the cross, and this seems to be a little bit earlier in his ministry. It seems like in this one, she's focusing more on the feet, and the other one, the other woman, whether it's the same woman or not, I don't think that the scripture tells us for sure that it is. It could, maybe it could be, but, but the second time he's anointed, it's Lazarus' sister for sure that anoints his head, and it's about a week before the cross. And he is specifically stated that she has anointed me for my burial. Okay. And so she knew exactly what she was doing in that particular scenario. This seems to be earlier in the process or in the ministry of Jesus. But, but what I want you to see right here is that she had a purpose. She knew Jesus sat in the Pharisee's house and she brought an alabaster box of ointment. I believe that I've studied before. I didn't look at it too close this time. But an alabaster box had to do with that mother of pearl stuff. And they would be able to shave it out of these uh, big clams or oysters or whatever. And they'd be able to make like a box out of it. So it was real pretty. And it would hold, when it says ointment, it's really describing like a perfume, okay? And so she comes in there. And what I want you to know is this, is that she heard that he was there. She went. And she already knew, I need you to understand, by the, just based on the testimony of the scripture itself, she already knew what she was going to do. She already had a plan. You understand, we can't see exactly how did, did she get an invitation? Was there paper papyruses nailed to the telephone poles up and down the street? Hey, Jesus is coming to Simon the Pharisee's house. Be there or be square. I, I kind of doubt it. I don't know. Did, it, did the word get out through word of mouth? I don't really know exactly, but she learned that Jesus sat down in Simon the Pharisee's house and she already showed up with a purpose in her hand. She came prepared with perfume to anoint him. I can't prove it because we aren't given it, but it appears to me personally, and this is my opinion, that she's already received forgiveness. <laughs> the way that this woman acts whenever she gets in the presence of the Lord, to me personally, seems like she's already experienced forgiveness. What, let me explain to you why I'm saying that. Okay, this is some of the things that I'm thinking. And again, I could be wrong because I'm, there's some speculation in this. But it's not like she just happen to stumble upon, oh, what's this crowd that's extend, 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 that's alabaster box. So when she knew that he was there, she showed up and she begins to exhibit behavior of a person, in my opinion, that's already forgiven. Now, I got to be clear on this. Listen, whenever you're in the house of the Lord and the Holy Spirit begins to move, many times you will find yourself becoming emotional, will you not? You will find yourself becoming emotional. You will feel tears fill up in your eyes. You, sometimes I have like moaned and groaned under the presence of the Lord. I get all of that. But at the same time, Many times whenever you've already been forgiven and you just enter in. Have you ever done that before where you're just driving down the road? If you've ever experienced an intimate, and listen, I'm not trying to pick on you. If you haven't, I want to encourage you to cry out to the Lord. If you've ever, ever experienced an intimate connection to the Lord where you're overwhelmed with emotion. And I'm not just talking about getting emotional just to get emotional because I've seen people do that too. That doesn't mean anything. I'm talking about though whenever you know that the Lord has ministered to you deep down on the inside. Amen. And, and then you've experienced that before, and then you may just be driving down the road. I mean, this has happened to me so many times. I'm just driving down the road, and it's almost like the way that life is because of how it can get you down. You know, it tries to. Does it not? It tries to get you down, right? And then you'll be, and you kind of be frustrated a little bit because you're a human being. I'm talking to humans, right? You're a human being, and you're driving down the road, and life's trying to beat you down and weigh you down with all of these burdens, and you're feeling a little bit frustrated, and you're a little bit irritated, and you're thinking some negative thoughts, and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit prompts you, and your heart's kind of even hard right then and there. You ever felt that way before? Is it okay if I just be a real preacher, and I tell you that I don't float on clouds? I don't float on clouds. And sometimes, like, I'm thinking, dude, I'm all frustrated. I'm all twisted up on the inside, and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, well, what about out here. That, that song y'all sing sometimes, Whisper His Name. I think y'all sing that, huh? Or somebody does. <laughs> Whisper His Name. What's His Name? Jesus. Call on His Name. Jesus. And there's been times I'll be driving down the road and I'm all twisted up. <laughs> and I'm like, frustrated. And, I, and the Holy Spirit say, Call on His Name. Jesus. 
changes the atmosphere, my friend. I'm telling you right now, it changes the atmosphere. And the Holy Spirit will descend down and inhabit the praises of his people. See, that's kind of what I'm seeing here. I don't know when it happened, but what I believe happened, in the, and again, speculation, okay, I, I get it, but I believe she was out there somewhere. She was out there, and in one of these crusades, the Lord touched her. She came to the realization that she was a sinful woman. I know who I am, Simon the Pharisee. I understand. I know better about myself than you know about me. And whenever he offered hope, I believe she responded. And I believe she felt the overwhelming forgiveness of the Lord. And I believe that the burden of guilt was lifted off of her. And I believe when she found out that he was at Simon the Pharisee's house, she grabbed that. Where's that alabaster box? Where? Oh, here it is is. And she said, I got a purpose in my heart because I have experienced the forgiving power of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm about to go give him what's due his name. I got to let him know. I got to let, I'll never forget. I don't even know why I just thought of this, but I did. I used to remember how I tell y'all earlier, maybe it's apropos. I used to sit there and take notes under that oak tree at lunchtime when they used to mark Mike brother Larson up for the little classes. Okay. He was teaching Bible college classes, and they would mic that up. That was way back in the gap before they even had the bookstore. I've been, do, I've been connected to this stuff for a long time. They didn't have the bookstore. They had a library up on the third floor, I believe it was. I went up there, dude. I found the honey hole. Found all them old cassette tapes, dude. I was buying all that stuff up. But anyway, before I ever showed up over there, for I guarantee you six, seven months, every lunch, had my little legal pad, my pen and paper, taking notes, taking notes, and learning. And I'll never forget, as I began to get the opportunity to preach, one time I preached a message, and they, they, they had it on a CD, and I got it from the church. And then he was coming to Lafayette to Pastor Stanley Senegal's church or something like that. And I went over there. And I said, man, I'm, I'm going to give that brother this CD. He didn't know who I was. I don't know why I felt like I needed to do that, but I did. I said, I, w- I went up to him. I said, hey, man, you don't know who I am, but I just need you to know something, bro. He probably never even listened to that CD, and that's fine. I wouldn't probably listen to it either. But I said, you don't know me. You don't know nothing about me. I'm just telling you, like, I'm just one little dude that sits under an oak tree and listens to you teach, and, and, and I take notes. And look, this is, I've been getting some opportunities to preach. If you ever have time, maybe listen to it on the way home. Just, and the only reason for this is not, they ain't trying to get nothing out of this. I just want you to know that this is what the Lord has put in my heart to speak to people based on the ministry that God has given you. Now, if he's too busy, of a man to be able to appreciate the fact that God used some little bitty old guy somewhere else or used him in some other, and that's, that's between him and the Lord. I didn't just do this for no reason. I felt like the Lord, my point is, is that in a way I was trying to bring him a gift. I was trying to let him know, hey, listen, I don't know, because, you know, you think Brother Larson don't ever go through anything? I didn't plan on preaching about Brother Larson this morning, but you think that man don't ever go through nothing? You think he's never tried? You think that people don't ever come against him? You don't think the enemy tries to frustrate him and irritate him and make him want to take his hands off the plow? If you think that, then you're confused. I can promise you the enemy's coming against him, and in my heart, I'm just like, hey, look, I'm just coming to bring this little offering to let you know it's not all in vain, brother. It's not all in vain. God is using you in somebody's life. Amen. And I'm just telling you, I feel like it was something like that. She's already experienced the forgiveness of the Lord. She is overwhelmed with gratitude. She desires to let Jesus know. Amen. She has a purpose. See, her behavior is consistent with a person that has experienced forgiveness. The actions that she exhibits to me Show a person that, he, that has been forgiven. See, what are, you, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, forgiven people look for Jesus. She's looking for him. She hasn't heard the words out on the street. He's at Simon the Pharisee's house. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going to be. She, I'm there, she wasn't invited. I can tell you that right now. She was not invited. Absolutely not. But that she said, but that's where I'm going. How many times do we let ourselves be kept out of a situation or a place just because, oh, what are they going to think about? Who cares what they think about you? You need, to get, we, you need to get over that. I need to get over that. Society's thinking all kind of, this Simon the Pharisee's thinking all kind of garbage about this woman, and he can't, he, his heart is full of religion. And I'm here to tell you that if you sit here and you worry about what society thinks about you, you will never be able to do very much for the Lord. 
You're not. And so forgiven people look for Jesus. Forgiven people desire to be where he is. And forgiven people serve him with what they have. Oh, that's a big one right there. Serve him with what they have. Oh, but my name is Moses and I don't speak eloquently. Give God what you have, Moses. And if you don't think you can do it, I'll send Aaron to back you up. Whatever it is that God is asking you to do, I guarantee you he will equip you to do it. Well, more, more of that later. She seems so determined, right? The context implies that she was a prostitute. I'm just telling you. Her reputation was that she was a sinner. She was a sinful woman. What does that mean? How do you determine that she was a prostitute from that? Well, because that's the idea. That's the context. During that time frame, I mean, women, for the most part, were pretty, I mean, quiet. And they did, they did the work of the house. They served their husbands. That's just how times were back then. So for this Pharisee to say, this is a sinful woman, the idea is she's got a reputation, She's got a reputation in the community. Amen? You know me. One, one of the things about me is I just want to be a raw preacher. I, I don't want to be all formal. One time I was having a conversation with a guy, and he was coming against the church. He said, you ain't got nothing but a bunch of drug addicts in your church. See, he and I had gotten into a disagreement about some things, <laughs> and it turned into a, kind of like a big old rigmarole. And I was on the phone with him. And he was like, your whole church is full of nothing but a bunch of ex-drug guys. He starts naming all these different people. And he said, hey, you, you, you were a drug addict too. <laughs> I, can't, I ain't going to lie to you. I said, dude, you were a whore. <laughs> I mean, I, do you think that I wanted to tell him that? No, I didn't. But guess what? He was pounding on everybody, and he so easily forgot who he was. You were a whore, dude. No, you were a male slut is what you were. And you're going to sit here and you're going to deride and you're going to come down. You don't understand the forgiving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't understand that he changes people. And you're self-righteous and you're hypocritical. And that's the problem. And that's the problem with where many people are. Maybe not quite as bad as that. Maybe they don't come out and say it because, you know, but they're thinking it, you see. And that's what, some of what we're seeing here. One source made the point that when a banquet for an important person was held, that uninvited guests were sometimes allowed in. But you know what they were supposed to do? They were supposed to sit quietly in the corner and just listen. Okay, so you were uninvited. Okay, we're going to let you in. But you really just need to be cool now. Don't break the rules. She crosses so many social boundaries. I mean, we don't know for sure, but it seems like she would have walked in there. You know, women had to keep their head covered back in them days. Seems like her hair was uncovered, or, or if it wasn't, she uncovered it. <laughs> so that she already crossed one boundary. She doesn't sit in the corner quietly. She doesn't. Now, it doesn't sound like she made a whole lot of verbal noise. I mean, it doesn't tell us she did, right? She doesn't sit in the corner quietly. And if she was a prostitute, this is just something I thought about. I can't prove it, but what kind of perfume was it? You know what I'm saying? Like, is this, is this all she had because this is something that she used in her trade? I don't, I don't know. I know that's a lot of speculation, but it's what she had. Was this something she had used in her trade? Was this all she had? Whatever. I don't know what it was exactly. Maybe it was something she was saving because, and in, in, I'm, I'm pretty sure that people believe that in the second uh, anointing that, that she was saving it for maybe the day that she got married because it would have been very costly, uh, some of these types of perfumes, you know, in the spice trade and all of these different things. But whatever it was, it was what she had, and, and she brought it with her. All I know is that she heard where Jesus was, and that is where she went. She went with something to give. I think that's important for us to stop just for a second and to consider that. She went to find the presence of the Lord, and she went with something to give to him. She was determined to give it to him. No matter what society thought about it, she was determined to fulfill her purpose, and her purpose was to serve him with what she had. Society wasn't going to like it. You think she didn't already know that? No, I need you to think about this. Th listen, I don't I thank God that I don't really usually, I don't deal with a lot of anxiety problems. I believe anxiety is a real deal. I personally believe it's an attack from the enemy, but that's another story for another time. Nevertheless, 
Just because I don't get panic attacks, thank God, does not mean I've never been in a situation where I became very anxious, okay, like where my heart started beating out of my chest. I can remember times, and many times for me personally, it's one of two things. It's either, number one, the Lord's trying to speak something to me. I'm just telling you what I've experienced spiritually. This is what I believe. It's either the Lord's trying to speak something to me, and I'm kind of not listening in a way, and I'm kind of doing my own thing, that the Lord starts, I mean, what happens to me is I start to feel nervous, and my heart, like, weird, because I never get physical changes in my heart. The day I got saved, my heart started beating out of my chest. The day I bought the timeshare, I've told y'all that story before. The Lord was trying to speak to me, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, dude, my heart starts probably, it was probably 130 beats a minute, and normal's 80, and I, I got a resting heart rate probably a 60, and so all of a sudden, and it's like the Lord's trying to tell me something, but I'm just, oh, no, I got a plan. I'm going to move forward, and so I'm just telling you, sometimes I believe it's the Lord that's trying to trying to show me those types of things. But there's also been times that I know I was in God's will and the enemy was trying to attack me to prevent me from moving forward. I can still remember the time before I had a church when I was doing different kinds of street ministry and there was a guy that was in the Ashland jail and they weren't letting any preachers in there. And I said, I wanted to bring him a Bible and I wanted to witness to him. And I said, Lord, if you won't let me in there, ain't nobody keep me out. And I prayed and I called up and boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, I'm walking through these doors and I'm walking down this hallway and I'm kind of like all by myself and I started imagining, I st you know, and the, and the enemy was trying to strike fear and I was like, you're a lying devil, man. The Lord done opened this door for me to walk down this hallway and to end up where he called me to end up. And listen, I stayed up in that jail for the next nine months. Oh, every, once a week, I'd go over there and I'd preach to them guys through the hatch hole. God opened up a door, but listen, the enemy was trying to come against me. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that I, can, you believe that she didn't feel a little weird when she was getting ready to walk up in there? Knowing that she's got this box, knowing what her plan is, knowing that there's likely a huge crowd up, all like gathered together up in this house, and she's about to go in here, and she's about to offer her services out to the Lord in worship and in humility. And you think that them glaring eyes ain't looking at her? You ever seen religious eyes look down on you? I've seen it before. I, I've seen it before. And I thank God that to now it's almost like a joke <laughs> because it's like, dude, if you only knew, you need to be free, my brother. You should be bound by a spirit of religion. But at one time, I didn't know that. And one, at one time, I would take it very personal. I, don't even, I wouldn't even take it personal anymore, I don't believe. Anyway, she heard where Jesus was. She had a purpose, and it was to serve him. And listen, I can guarantee you that every devil in hell was trying to prevent her from showing up in that place. The second thing that I wanted to talk to you about was this, about the, a ministry of gratitude. See, I titled my message this morning, Ministry to Jesus. See, I'm talking about ministering to the Lord. I might lose my train of thought, so let me just go ahead and get out of my heart what I'm trying to describe. When we, there's a lot of different ways I believe we can minister to the Lord. But let's, let's just stop for a second and let's just imagine what the Lord has done. The Lord condescended or humbled himself and became a man for one purpose, because it was the Father's will for him to die as the sacrifice, to purchase the souls of men back to God, like it says in Revelation 5. You have purchased the souls of men with your blood. You have redeemed us from every tongue, tribe, and nation. That's, what it's gonna, that's the song that's going to be saying in the end. You have redeemed us with your blood. So Jesus willingly lowered himself and condescended in humility in order to accomplish the will of the Father. So if we think about that, how important that was to the Lord. And then now we want to take the idea of ministering to Jesus. There's so many different ways that we can really minister to Jesus. Simply by accepting the gospel of truth, in a sense, you're ministering to Jesus. What I'm trying to say is, is that if God bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession and he sent Jesus to die on the cross, the simplicity, even though you didn't really understand what you were getting into at that time, you were drawn by the Lord, the simplicity of you accepting the Lord's sacrifice, in a sense, is ministering to Jesus because you're giving worse to what he did, you're accepting what he did, you're, you're acknowledging the power of what he did, and you're now, you're giving back to him. Amen. 
In addition to that, every time you pray to the Lord, in a sense, you could be ministering to the Lord, as long as you're not doing it for the wrong purpose. But as you're praying to the Lord, as you show up in church, as you lift your hands and worship to God, but it's so much bigger than that. It's bigger than a church service. It's a way of life. Ministry to Jesus is a way of life. Every time you help someone out there that needs help, you're ministering to Jesus because if the motive of why you're doing it, as long as it's not to be seen by men, if your motives are to be seen by men, it's going to be burned up in the end. But if your motives were to minister, I'm in, Lord. I'm, I'm convinced that what you did is what set me free. I'm in, Lord. I want to minister. I want to give back to you. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he lives in me. Now this life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. When you minister to the Lord, you're laying your life down. <laughs> it's a worship service, my friend. Worship is not, I know I keep saying it, worship is part of a song. Song service is a type of worship, but worship ain't a song service. Yeah. Worship is a lifestyle. Yeah. Worship is a laying down, a surrendering, a sacrificial love back to the Lord. Amen? Yeah. So in the ministry of gratitude, look at this. She stood at his feet. Behind him, weeping. Gratitude. That's what I see oozing off of her. Thankfulness. Oh, I'm so thankful. <laughs> Grab this alabaster box and I'm going to walk through this crowd. I know that they're looking at me. They're glaring down at me with religious eyes. How many of them did she sleep with in the past? How many of those self-righteous religious men had actually paid a price to sleep with her? She probably just kept her head down and kept her eyes on the floor so that she wouldn't have to see that because what shame, huh? But she had one purpose. She knew her purpose. <laughs> her purpose wasn't to be there for none of these people. She was just focused on the Lord and was coming to give back to him because he had given to her. It was a ministry of gratitude. Don't you kind of agree that her response seems like a person who's already been forgiven? People that have not experienced forgiveness and salvation cannot completely appreciate the presence of the Lord. They can sometimes tell that his presence is there and that something has changed in the climate. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, listen, even an unbeliever can tell, oh, man, I felt the goosebumps on that one. I mean, I've seen it so many times in the, just in the clinic. I'm over there just talking to them. Ooh, I feel that. And I know they ain't saved, but that the Lord will let them feel it. Just as the temperature, I was thinking about this. You ever, look, if you've been a fisherman, y'all know what I'm talking about, but I used to work offshore a little bit, man. You talk about a beautiful, it'd be the heat of the summertime. And all of a sudden, you'd see this black sky. And then all of a sudden, the wind starts blowing. Oh, man, the temperature just dropped about 35 degrees in two minutes. And you talk about feel good. Now, you know there's a big old mess coming. You're about to have to put your slicker suit on. But for about 10 minutes, maybe, oh, oh for 10 minutes, man, you, you, have you ever experienced, look, you men know what I'm talking about. You ladies know what I'm talking about. Have you ever experienced anything in nature that can be too much better than that for that 10 minutes to feel go from, from 100 and something degrees to drop 35 degrees in that cool wind blowing on you and just how refreshing that is? Amen? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Just as, that, just as that front rolling in and the temperature dropping, so the spiritual climate of the heart can feel something different whenever you walk into the presence of the Lord. And that's what I believe is personally happening. Again, I can't prove it, but I believe she's already been forgiven. I believe she has a plan. She goes over there with this box in her hand. She has a plan that she's going to anoint the Lord. She's about to give him glory. She's about to show him thankfulness for what it is that he's done. I know it seems silly, but that's really what was in my heart when I gave him that little CD. And I just wanted him to be able to listen to a little bit of it to let him know how thankful I was that the Lord had showed me the things that he was showing me. I don't know. He probably didn't realize, like, oh, Lord, here. You know, because you know what you can think in your head. Oh, here we go. He probably wants to come preach at Family Worship Center or something like that. <laughs> Nevertheless, 
This is what she did. She came to give, right? She was a sinner with deep debt. She felt the weight of sin. There's not too much that feels better in nature, like I said, when that temperature drops, but I can assure you that there is nothing better spiritually than when a heart that is overburdened with guilt and condemnation and hopelessness feels the weight of sin removed, her response in his presence. It looks like that to me. It just looks like a heart that's already been forgiven. She just walks up in there, and I can't even, I've shared with y'all before about how, like, when I, the first time I carried that cross down the road, how strange it felt. My heart was beating fast. Everything was telling me, don't even walk outside of the driveway with this. You fool. You're a buffoon. You look like an idiot. And then as soon as I get on the road, and I just start praying in tongues. Precious Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for setting me free, Lord. Thank you for revealing your truth to me. Lord, every eye, some of the eyes that will look at me, the majority of them will think that I am a complete fool, and that's exactly what I am, Lord. I want to be a fool in your presence. I want to be a fool for you, O oh Lord. And at the same time, there's going to be others that are going to be convicted. There's going to be others that are going to be overwhelmed with joy to see a disciple of the Lord. They're going to come, and, they're, and there's going to be others that are going to say, hey, what are you doing? And, and you're going to give me opportunities. I believe it, Lord, to pray with people and to minister to people. And, Lord, I'm just asking you to do what only you can do. In the midst of a society that's going to think I'm a fool, I pray that you would take foolishness, oh, Lord God, and that you would cut to the heart of both believer that's living in complacency and sinner that is outside of your will and that you would move on their hearts so, Lord God, and that you would effect change in their life. I don't know if she understood what she was about to get into, but I'm telling you right now, we don't even get told the rest of the story. How many people in that room were affected by this turn of events? I'm telling you right now, dude. Like, and, and we're about to get into that, too. I don't know what this old boy's motives were, this Pharisee about inviting Jesus. This is, that alone is kind of weird. And we'll get into that in a second. I don't know what his motives were, I don't, but obviously he was the talk of the town, my friend. When you start healing blinded eyes and you start calling, causing lame people to walk and you start performing miracles and the crowds are thronging, he's now the, the muy importante person on the block. And now Simon the Pharisee has him in his house. And I can guarantee you that the crowd is in there. And that people are so, they don't know what to expect. They're not in there for the right reason. She, and she enters into the scene. And I'm telling you right now, she causes conflict in the midst of that scene. I believe that. You know, I notice a distinct difference. Well, hold on a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Society has a way of making us feel awkward, right? So she's standing beside him weeping. She begins to weep. Whatever was normal for society that wasn't really on her mind at that moment, right? She had one thought, one motive, one purpose, give back to Jesus after he had given to her. And I was thinking about how society has a way of making us feel inadequate. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about. I ain't trying to get all psychological on you, man. I'm just trying to, like, talk truth. Society has a way of making us feel inadequate, awkward, or just not welcome. Churches, let us not be a church like that. Amen? Amen? Don't, don't be... I want you to, right now while I'm saying this, I want you to be mindful of yourself. I want you to be mindful of your presentation when visitors come into the church. I want you to understand that as hard as it is for you to walk through the church doors, sometimes you're part of this church. You need to understand that people that ain't never been here before, how they might be feeling walking in here. They might feel like her. They don't know what to expect. I'm imploring you. Just even if you don't feel comfortable enough to walk up to them and extend a handshake, make, try to make eye contact and smile. And, and then if you're a little bit more bold, say, we're glad you made it today. And if you're even more bold, say, hey, man, good to see you. My name's Rob or whatever your name is. Shake their hand. Be kind. Amen. I mean, that's just basic Christianity 101. Amen. I mean, listen, I'm all about let's have a packet co committee and let's, like, welcome them. And all. But can we just get the basics down? Let the love of God abide in your heart. Yes. Amen. Let the love of Christ. Amen. Listen, I know you're going through stuff, church. I know it. I am too. 
But guess what? The love of the Lord is 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 the Lord religious the religious or the cool crowd y'all ever been around cool crowd people y'all know what i'm talking about the other day somebody at peak was like man all them people you know with the circles you run i'm like dude it ain't like that with me bro it ain't never been like that with me they i, I i'm just too real <laughs> bro they, the cool crowd don't like people like me. The good old boy network, I ain't part of their network because it's fake. <laughs> it's fake. Like daddy used to say, quit blowing smoke, boy. Just tell the truth. Give it to me real. I ain't got time for all that. Season my speech with salt, though, Lord, so that I can accomplish what you've called me to do. Amen? So society has a way of making us feel inadequate, and the good old boy network, all that can add feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, not belonging to, to a heart that's already broken. <laughs> Some of you know, look, the proverb says, if you find yourself at a rich man's table, or you find yourself at a king's table, I might be misquoting it, but it has something like put the knife to your throat, because you might partake of his delicacy. You're going to allow yourself to come into the presence of a powerful person, and you're going to allow yourself to be influenced by them. You know, the other day when I was at, at peak of Wade's cousin, Justin, I was trying to explain about people that hang out with unbelievers and how there can be a danger connected to that. And, you know, the Lord doesn't want us to be isolated, but he does want us to be separated and I was trying to explain that to somebody. And I was like, well, dude, you can say you don't want to leave them people behind, but if you ain't ready to go back and minister to them, you're just going to be falling right back. Don't fool yourself. And I remember Justin made this comment. He said, he said this. He said, this, is, this sums it up for me. And he showed me this little thing off Facebook that he had screenshotted in his phone, and it said this. When Jesus ate with sinners, they were changed. He wasn't. Isn't that good? That's the difference. If you're sitting there in the presence of sinners and you're partaking in what it is that they're partaking, you are not walking in the will of God for your life as a believer. But if you, like this woman, can show up where the cool crowd is, where the good old boy network is, and you can, with your one heart, one mind, one purpose, walk up in there to give glory to the Lord, not caring what social stigmas look like, not caring what society believes, then God can use you a sinful woman forgiven by grace to prick the hearts of self-righteous people and to cause a change on the inside of them. We don't know what happened to all of these people that were in that room, but I wouldn't be surprised if most of them didn't get saved that day. I really like this woman. She inspires me. I want so badly to be like her. I don't want to sit at the table with the rich and the powerful if they're also pompous. I would much rather be like her and through a genuine heart of repentance and gratitude shake everyone else out of their self-righteous religious slumber. I would rather break religious or societal norms instead of submitting to their rules if it helps get attention and shines the light on the Lord. That's what I want to do. I don't need you. I, listen, you may not agree with me. You're like, well, no, no, no. And that's fine. God hasn't called everybody to do it the same way. I'd rather be like her. I'd rather be like her than the powerful Pharisee that's sitting in this house and thinking that he's got something all put together. You know them people. Oh, their checkbook is, is balanced to the T, and they, their car is always clean. Like, I ain't trying to fit, make fun. Listen, if you got your checkbook balanced, praise God for you. Because really and truly, you're supposed to balance your checkbook. But I'm talking about the attitude behind that person. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Everything's just perfect. Right? They, they, they look like they're perfect. You've seen Christians like that before, too, huh? You've actually probably questioned in your heart why my life wasn't like that. Look at them. Look at this man, this woman. They done got married. Look at them children. Now, all them children serving the door, they going to church. I'm going to just leave that alone. They go to church. They got their hair straightened, and their, their family portrait looks really good. But are they really serving the Lord? 
I'm not the Holy Spirit. I, I'm not here to judge, but I'm just trying to say many times we look at people that seem like they're so well put together on the outside, but what's going on on the inside? So I like her so much. I want to be like her, all right? I, but I also notice a distinct difference in the motives or actions between the Pharisee and the woman. And I can't prove it, but it seems that his purpose is to be seen by men. It just seems that way. Well, I know for a fact that there's something not right in his heart. I, because the text tells us that, right? He, is to, he wants to be seen by men, likely an internal motive, even maybe to try to find some dirt on the Lord. See, and no, if you know the New Testament well enough, if you understand the Gospels, then you ought to know this. The Pharisees repeatedly tried to poke holes in Jesus. Listen, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus end up getting saved in the end. But even Nicodemus, whenever he tends to be more enticed by what Jesus is doing, in the beginning of the book of John, the Bible says he went to Jesus by night. He didn't want to be seen. His group of people, he was being influenced by them too, but he had enough wherewithal in him that he said, I got to go talk to this teacher. I got to go find out what's going on. Look at these miracles he's doing. We're over here saying that he's not Messiah, but what if he is who he says he is? But most of these Pharisees were against Jesus. They were constantly trying to set a trap for him. Okay, so it makes me wonder, what was his real motives? Now that Jesus is becoming popular, it's the cool thing to do, invite Jesus into the house. But what is he really trying to do? The previous chapter in Luke records that the Lord had already had conflict with the Pharisees. Just in chapter 6, you can read it. You remember that's the story where Jesus was in the synagogue and there was a man with a withered hand. And Jesus healed his hand. And it was on the Sabbath. And these religious people are fussing because Jesus did work on the Sabbath. He did that on purpose. To purposefully break societal norms because they had the wrong impression of God to begin with. Said the Sabbath was not, the Sabbath is something from God that provides rest and healing for people. He goes on and he tells them, if you had an ox in the ditch, you would stop everything to get your ox out. What about this man? And he repeatedly did those kinds of things to mess with the religious leaders. So he's already at odds with them in the chapter just before this one. So that's why it really makes me wonder, what is the real motives of this Pharisee's heart? Why did he even invite Jesus over there? So again, what was the real motive? We are, we are given a glimpse into his heart, though, right? Because he's repulsed with her and he's unimpressed with Jesus. Now think about this. Listen, the Holy Spirit made sure that Dr. Luke put in here, because it says this in the King James, he spoke to himself. I'm talking about the Pharisee. What does that mean? His thoughts. The Holy Spirit gives us a glimpse into the mind of this Pharisee. The Holy Spirit wants readers for all the ages to be able to know what was in the head of this Pharisee. How did this come about, this information? I really don't know. Was it after they left? Were some of Jesus' disciples there with him? And did Jesus share with them, hey, did, y'all, did that gift of discernment work on y'all whenever? Did y'all see the, the look on that Pharisee? You want to know what he was thinking? Oh, no, Lord, I already know the Holy Spirit showed me. The Holy Spirit showed me that he was thinking... If this man really was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman it was that was touching him. I saw it, Lord. I know what you're talking about. The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I I felt it. The Holy Spirit wants you and I to know that something was wrong with this Pharisee's heart. There's a reason that the Lord wants us to see that. And I personally believe it's a fancy word. It's called juxtaposition. It's a comparison and a contrast between this Pharisee's heart and what's going on in his head in this woman, and the actions that she's showing us with her life. So again, what was the real motive? He said he was unimpressed. His thoughts reveal his heart. If he was a real prophet, right? According to the Lord's own words, the Pharisee neglected his needs. I'm talking about Jesus' needs. Listen, you can do research in various commentaries, and you can learn that basic courtesy when when a guest entered into your house basic courtesy was to have your servants wash the feet of your guests that was basic it was and and it would be a blessing to a traveler or a guest in your home to anoint their head with oil because see they, they didn't have the 
all the emollients and the lotions. And I mean, they had some things, but they didn't have it like we got it today. And they lived all outside and they didn't really have air conditioning like we have. And they were constantly in the heat of the sun. And so oil on the face or on the head was a very, uh, it was a very comforting thing. Okay. And, and obviously it was something that was offered and whenever you were trying to treat your guests properly, it'd be kind of like if you invited somebody over to your house, hey, can I get you a drink of water? What about some of these snacks? Would you like some of this? Hey, look, man, just turn the TV on and, and make yourself at home, watch what you want to watch. It's that kind of courtesy that's, that's being extended to a guest in your house. And whenever I look at this particular story, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's like he, doesn't, he just neglected Jesus. Jesus is just sitting there as a guest in this man's house. He's got a dry face and dirty feet. And then it makes me wonder, see, I think his thoughts reveal his heart. While his thoughts reveal his heart, her actions reveal hers. We have to be careful we don't get the wrong impression about works, right? You know what I'm saying? While works can be viewed the wrong way, And through them, a person attempts to earn right standing with God. That's wrong. At the same time, God's favor, because God's favor cannot be earned. Look, God gave his favor to man as a gift by giving us Jesus as a ransom for our sin. But works are supposed to be a natural outflow from a forgiven and grateful heart. Let me say that again. Works are supposed to be a natural outflow from a heart that has been forgiven and is grateful to the Lord. That should be something that the Spirit is urging you on to do. Amen? The Holy Spirit in you should be, if you're, feel, if you're not feeling compelled, and as a matter of fact, I'm probably, it's probably in point number three, so let me not get ahead of myself. But if you're feeling frustrated when you're doing works for the Lord, that ain't it. It might be best just to stop. For a while, at least. But understand, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to do works for the Lord. Just, we just got to get our heart right behind it. Unless it can happen to anybody. You need to understand that. You, life can be wear you down. I can remember, and I refused, because I knew enough about the Lord. I was mature enough in the Lord. I'm like, Lord, I'm not going to allow these things to happen. I know the plans of the enemy. I, I know some of his trickery. I don't know it all, but, I, but I've experienced enough of his trickery to know he's trying to make my heart bitter. You know, whenever the, whenever the church where I used to go, hey, man, write us a Sunday school curriculum. Okay, so I write this whole Sunday school curriculum, introducing them to the concepts of the message of the cross. And they're going to start all of these little small group studies. Even one of the pastors is like, hey, man, he wants me to do whatever, but would you mind writing my thing to whatever? So I spend, I'm absolutely, brother, what, what is your thing on? And, and, I, and I spend time to write all, all of that stuff. And, and, and if I could just sit here and tell you the way that, that I was treated after the fact and the, and the way that people acted towards it, and, the, and the, it was just the weirdest thing. It was like they basically just took it and, well, I don't want to throw my notes, but Okay. That was good, but that didn't work. Let's, let's start over again. Let's try again. I can remember one of the guys that had been in the faith for some length of time, and he said, I mean, this is good, but it's so, it's so basic. We're going back to the elementary principles. See, but he, he didn't even understand what he was talking about. Poor guy. He thought the elementary principles about forgiveness of sins and the laying on of hands and baptism was talking about New Testament theology, but it was actually talking about Old Testament. And that the letter to the Hebrews was warning the people not to go back to the old ways. And that he thought that he understood the cross. Because it's such a simple message that everybody knows the cross. Because Jesus died to save everybody. But that's the problem, dude. You're missing the point. It's not just to save you. It's also to sanctify you. And you're so knee deep in a word of faith movement that you can't even see past your own toes. But if you could humble yourself enough to try to actually find the heart of what's being said here, then the Lord might be able to minister to your heart and heart and set you free. But you already got it all figured out because you've been in the faith so long. And one thing after the other, and even the pastor that asked me to write his part, he's like, I don't agree with you mad about blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. That's fine. 
but a ministry of gratitude. Amen. She sat behind his feet and she wept. So works can be viewed the right way, but again, works are supposed to be a natural outflow from a forgiven and grateful heart. I know I'm going long today. We did communion, so I'm not going to turn to the passage, but in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus told them, he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I just want you to know that believers do good works for God. And I need you to understand, too, that your good works that you're called to do are not just within the walls of a church. Amen? It's important that we understand that. I mean, I can tell you right now, and I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we need help in the church in various ways. And, and, and all help is appreciated. But guess what? Ministering and worshiping Jesus with your life is not just done in the walls of the church. It's a life of sacrifice Understanding that when you minister to other people in some way, shape, or form to, in hopes to get them closer to Jesus, that you are ministering to Jesus. You're recognizing his worth and his value, and you're giving back to him. And so I just want to encourage you with that. Listen, you should be just as excited if you're strumming a guitar. You should be more excited. I'm just saying, for somebody like Yvette, you should be more excited whenever you get to minister to somebody at the bank, even just give them a little scripture, than what you are just even strumming a guitar. <laughs> or what? Or the chimes. Yes, or the chimes. <laughs> Amen. And I, and I mean that with all sincerity, or at least as much. I'm not trying to give one power over the other, but, dude, these things are important. Amen. Amen? All right. <clears throat> Number three, a mirror for our walk. And the mirror is her actions versus his thoughts. I want you to get that in your head. I want you to understand. Originally, I had some assessment tools for your own walk, meaning you can use her actions and his thoughts to assess your own walk with God to some extent. It's not going to tell you everything you need to know about your own heart. The word of the Lord will reveal things about your heart. But I believe that the Lord wants us to understand that we can assess our own walk by looking at the actions of others sometimes and also considering our own thoughts whenever they're not right. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more so that we make sure we're on the same page. We can learn about a lot about our own ministry or walk from our own thoughts and by watching the actions of other people. It's important to understand that true worship is actually ministry to the Lord. Amen? Worship is not just a song service. It's a life given back in service to God. And I noticed something, what I would consider practical about serving God from these two characters. He serves out of what seems like responsibility. You know, listen, responsibility is an important thing. So I don't want you to, don't put words in my mouth. Oh, you don't want us to be responsible. No, the Lord wants you to be responsible. He wants you to build your life on the rock. When you build your house on a rock, it's stability. Along with stability, it's more than that it just rhymes with responsibility. It, the, the two go hand in hand. There's a lot of importance to the concept of responsibility. But if you're ministering to Jesus just through responsibility, that's only going to take you so far. Sooner or later, you're going to get burnt out. Sooner or later, you're not. And listen again, I can't go, go through it enough. Responsibility is an awesome trait in people's lives. You know, sometimes we just do the right thing. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Amen. He serves out of what seems like responsibility. He just does the basics. He invites the important person to his home. He doesn't see the needs of the Lord. He has his own agenda. What I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm creating this in my mind, what can inviting this prophet do for me? I'm imagining that maybe he's thinking that. She serves from a heart whose eyes have been enlightened to his worth. I think that's important for us to understand that. I know I've been using a lot of words. I know y'all been here a long time, but just bear with me for a second. The eyes of the heart that have come to the conclusion of how worthy the Lord is, that's a big deal. Because sometimes even though you've been coming to church and even though you may be a, a Christian, you may not have had your, the eyes of your heart opened to the, how valuable Jesus is because that's something that the Holy Spirit has to do. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Some of you have been in the faith long enough, y'all know what I'm talking about. That there's times in your life when you were doing things out of responsibility, but then you came to a place that you overwhelmed with gratitude because of what God had done in your life, that now you're serving him. It's, it's from a different place. 
Amen? She serves from a heart and comes prepared with what she has available to give what she has to God. I'm thinking to myself, again, I can't prove it, but all of her attention is, is undoubtedly on him. I mean, she's got one thing on her mind. Did she plan to anoint his head instead of his feet? I don't know. When she saw his feet, this is something that I thought about. When she saw his feet, did she feel something that we can't understand because we weren't in that room? And, and, and what I mean by this, and this is postulation, but I just imagine in my mind Jesus being the only one at the table that has dirty feet. Now, I can't prove it, but I, it wouldn't surprise me. I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I know it's speculation, but it wouldn't surprise me because I don't think the Pharisee's heart, I know the Pharisee's heart isn't right because we got a glimpse into his heart. If this man was a real prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. Puh, what a joke. I invited this guy to my, he don't even know this sinful woman and what she's doing, how she's touching on him. So I know for a fact that his heart ain't right, right? And, and, and so it makes me wonder, did, can you imagine people scheming like that? He, Jesus done came against the Pharisees in the chapter before, made them look like, makes them look like fools on more than one occasion, okay, because he's trying to get them right too. He's trying to correct the societal norms, and it would not surprise me one bit if he didn't make him the guest of honor but at the same time not give him any honor. Again, I can't prove it. But I wonder, is it possible that everyone else's feet had been washed except his? Is it possible everybody else's head has been anointed with oil except his? Is that what caused her to become so emotional? I can't prove it. That she came with understanding of his value? I can guarantee you she came with that. She came understanding the value of the Lord. Many believers don't understand the value of the Lord. She came primed and ready, alabaster box with ointment in the hand, ready to give value to the Lord, ready to give him glory, ready to lay her life down in service to Jesus. And then realize that maybe no one else understood his value. So she could only do what a servant must do in that moment and minister to her master. But she didn't come prepared for what she saw. I don't think she did. She came prepared to anoint his feet, but she didn't come prepared to wash them. The Bible doesn't say that she grabbed the rag that she had tucked into her dress. It says that with her tears, she began to wash his feet and she began to wipe them with the hairs of her head. She didn't come prepared for that, but what she can use to clean his feet before she anoints them. All she has is her tears and her hair. So that is what she uses. I mean, think, you gotta think about it. This is a big deal. I mean, she is like an emotional, she is a, a spectacle right now. The whole room is looking at her. I mean, you think she's quiet, crying quietly? <laughs> I don't think so. I think she's, I think she's crying loud. I think she's wailing. I think her heart's broken. Her heart is grateful for forgiveness, but at the same time broken because others don't see the value of the Lord. She just cries. Those tears, hot tears dripping on them dirty feet. <laughs> and then she, who knows, maybe she even felt a little bit weird about that. Maybe she didn't plan on necessarily washing his feet with her tears. And she was just sitting there like, oh, my God, Jesus, you forgave me. And then the tears start dropping, and then maybe she feels weird about that. Oh, my gosh, I'm crying on his feet. I don't have a way to clean him. And she's, I don't know, but, I mean, it wouldn't make, it makes sense. And she sits there, and she's just cleaning the, the feet, and it just kept going on and on because that's what Jesus says. Jesus served us with his life. He offers forgiveness. Now we are to minister to him. And what does that mean to serve him, love him? Yes. Go to church? Yes. Pray? Read? Yes. Give back? Yes. Who are we giving back to when we talk about ministry? Who do we give back to when we sing or play music or preach or teach the kids? Who do we minister to when we clean the church or drive the kids somewhere or watch the nursery or operate the words on the screen? Is this for the church or the pastor? I hope not. Because you, uh, you ain't going to serve the Lord very long if you're doing it for me because I'm going to irritate you. And I didn't purchase your soul with my blood. And I, can't, I don't even want you to love me this much. 
It would be weird if you loved me that much. Amen? I want to love you, and I want you to love me. But I, don't, I know you wouldn't. I know I'm the hard person to love. I know it wouldn't be like that. But I'm just trying to make a point, amen, that he's the one that we're in ministry for. He's the one that we're laying our life down for. He's the one that we're serving for. Is it for the church or the pastor? I can tell you we need help. The church needs help, but this is about Jesus. We need to worship the Lord and minister to the Lord. Maybe the singers and musicians could come up. We're going to close with a song. Altars are always open. When we close out with this song, I'm just going to encourage you that with eyes of your heart enlightened, to the value of Jesus, just from your own heart and thoughts to let the Lord know how grateful you are. Give your worship to him, amen. My prayer before we sing this, before we worship this song is, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts, Lord, where we, like this woman, would be able to see your value where we, like this woman, would sacrificially give back unto you because you're worthy. No matter what we go through or face, Lord God, we all in this room collectively agree you're worthy. And so we want to worship you together, Lord, individually and together. And we want to let you know that we're grateful in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's exalt the Lord. Amen. Let's speak to the